So this is the time Nathan's famous used the dead rotting well to try and sell hot dogs. Internet rapper historian Professor Jelly here. Have you ever been eating a dog with the boys and thought, hey fellas, you know what this needs? A dead rotting fish right next to us. Well this is exactly what Nathan's Famous cooked up one summer in 1954. To set the scene, Nathan's Famous was created in 1916 by Polish immigrant Nathan Hanworker and one of the things that always really set Nathan apart from his competition was his marketing and promotional skills. This is called foreshadowing. Cause it ain't easy becoming the weenie hut kingpin. One of the hardest things that Nathan ever had to actually do was to get people to trust his hot dogs enough to actually eat them. Cause if you think that hot dogs have a bad reputation today, you have no idea how bad that their reputation was in 1916. The health regulations were so bad at that point, it would have been safer for you to just go around licking people's tires than take a chance buying a pound of hamburger meat from the Piggly Wiggly. And then you got Nathan over here trying to sell a half price tube of mystery meat at a theme park where one of the biggest draws is a jet of air that shoots up women's skirts. So, so yeah, yeah, he had a few people to convince. One of the ways that he was able to convince people that his dogs were safe to eat was he started calling them kosher style. Now, were they actually kosher? They were not kosher. You know, they were like kosher adjacent. You know, another big publicity stunt that he had, and probably his most famous, was hiring doctors to come around and eat his hot dogs in their doctor uniforms. Or, more often than not, homeless men dressed up as doctors. And it worked. People began ordering dogs by the dozen. Nathan's turns into this national landmark. The national anthem plays. Tears run down George Washington's face. You know, happy ending. So this leads us to our main story. By 1954, Nathan finally decided that after 40 years of 20 hour days, he had finally gotten to the point where he could take a vacation slash business trip and leave the store in the control of his son, Murray Handmarker. Now Murray obviously had some big shoes to fill and he would fill them full of regret. One day while minding the store, presumably trying to come up with the next big publicity stunt for Nathan's, Murray was approached by this guy named Leif Sarengard who offered Murray the opportunity of a leaf time. See, somehow, Leaf had come into possession of a 75 foot, 140,000 pound embalmed whale. How? How? Where? Where, where, where do you get, where do you get those, Leaf? Where do you get those? <laughs> now, dead whale shows were not unheard of at the time. They toured around the Northeast amusement park circuit, but you know, they just never been next to a restaurant. But you can bet, Buster, that was about to change, because after some talking, Leaf convinced Murray to pay him to place the dead whale in the lot directly next to Nathan's hot dogs. Dad is gonna be so proud. Throughout this whole story, you really get the feeling that, like, Murray is the kid who wakes up early on Father's Day to cook Dad breakfast in bed and then burns down the house. I mean, he's really got the whole heart of gold, head of mush thing going on. He just, he just cares so much. And believe it or not, for the next couple of days, it actually worked. People really did come out to see the well, and a few of them even bought a hot dog when they did it. Win-win. I can really just see Murray like waking up in the morning like, yep, it feels pretty good to be this smart. Like he's getting the publicity shots taken from whenever they put him on the cover of Time Magazine. Like it's all turning up Murray. And it was until the summer heat wave hit. Now, embalming a human body is already like a very, very difficult process. Now imagine doing that on a bee 700 times the size. So whatever preservation had been done on the well soon begins to wear off in the boiling heat. And this well begins to stink like no stink has ever stunk before. It's also at this point that um, somehow, just coincidence, uh, nothing more to look into it, Leaf leaves town without collecting the well. Um, must have just forgot about it. So if Leaf out of the picture, Murray really realizes just how screwed he is. I mean, there's no way to get rid of this well. It weighs 70 tons and is as long as a semi truck. We don't even know how Leaf got it there. Like seriously, like we, we don't know. I mean, like in all the stories, there's no documentation on how Leaf transported that well to Coney Island. So with no other option, Murray pinches his nose and lets the well rot 
By June, the well is giving off such a noxious odor, Murray's getting summons by the New York Health Department. Murray gets so desperate that he puts a request in the paper that if somebody, anybody, knows how to sunproof a well, to please, please let him know. And just whenever you think it's gotten as bad as it can get, it gets worse. See, after presumably being unable to get enough SPF 50 to sunproof the well, Murray started drenching the well in gasoline to kill the smell. You can probably see where this is going. The well catches on fire. Thick black smoke shoots out of its mouth like the Balrog from Lord of the Rings. The fire department has to show up. Thousands of people crowd around to watch the spectacle. Murray, I'm sure, cries in this office. By this point, Nathan's Famous has become the town laughingstock. The well, who had actually originally been named Mrs. Heroy for a Norwegian island, is now going by Stinky, and people were avoiding Nathan's like the plague. Now this is according to the rumors whenever the story turns into a deleted scene from Goodfellas. Murray, with no options left, calls the mob up, who send in two hitmen who come and blow the well up in the middle of the night on the beach, shooting presumably a fireworks show of well guts up into the sky. I'm just going to tell you that 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 didn't happen. Like the mob isn't actually in the business of you know waste management. That, that that's a front. Tony Soprano isn't going to come at 2 a.m. to blow up a well on Coney Island. So the truth of the matter actually seems to be that there was just some guy, also probably called Stinky, who charged Murray some astronomical fee to hack the well apart and then ferry it to a landfill on Staten Island. So Murray finished disposing of the well in like late July, which was just in time for Daddy Handworker to be coming home from Florida. And boy did Murray have a fish story or two to tell him. Murray later said, Pop let me know what he thought about this cockamamie promotion. And he was a pop electic when he found out how much it cost me to hire a man to cut up the well and tow it out to sea. The business didn't recover for weeks. Eventually though, business did recover. And actually later, Murray took over as chairman for the store, expanding it nationwide. Even though he went on to do much bigger and better things, for the people of Coney Island, Murray Handworker would always be known as the dead well guy. And some say to this day that if you go to Nathan's and listen to the wind on a hot day, you can still smell old stinky. <clears throat> this has been Professor Jelly. <clears throat> if you like this video and you want to see more, please subscribe. <clears throat> do it, do it, do it, do it.